Barbara, over to you. It's wonderful to see everyone here this evening and thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, Rowan, to our webinar. You're an old friend. We've known you for many years now. Uh, you began as our chairman a long time ago and then you were president and now a patron. And as I was thinking about this evening, I reminisced a little about all our conferences, the talks you've given there and the courses we've run. And I felt very uplifted by going through some of those memories from the past. And of course, the very special memory of when we came to Lambeth Palace when you were Archbishop of Canterbury. That was a wonderful time. It was a refreshment, I think, looking back on it, refreshment for body and mind and spirit. And I really want to say that that is something very, very special about you, Rowan, that you are not just a wonderful academic, though you are a wonderful academic, and the church benefits from that, we all do, but you are also a good, I think the best teacher I've ever known, a good teacher and a wonderful enabler. And I think this evening, we will all learn something of your wisdom, um, of your thoughts, of your journey, but we will also, I'm quite sure, be challenged to look into our own journeys, our own spiritual journeys, and to delve into possibilities there of how we change and how we grow. So thank you. And together, we look forward to Holy Week and Easter. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Barbara for your very, very generous introduction. And thanks to everybody for joining in this evening. I look forward to hearing your questions and reflections later on. And as Barbara has said, I'm not a stranger to Christians Aware, and I have very vivid and very grateful memories of what is now indeed many decades of friendship with everyone. So thanks to all of you for many years. I've been encouraged to reflect with you a little bit about approaching Holy Week at Easter, as we do so this year. And I'm very glad that Barbara used the word journey in her introduction, because there's a very strong sense in which the whole celebration of Holy Week begins in travel. The first thing we know about any celebrations of what we now call Holy Week come from probably the late 4th century, when we have the records of a pilgrim who went to Jerusalem during this period and observed what happened in Jerusalem in the days approaching Easter. This is a youngish woman from Spain who might have been a nun, though we're not completely sure of that, and who wrote a very vivid and very delightful memoir of her excursion to the Holy Land, which at that time was newly Christianized, you might say, a big building program had taken place around Jerusalem, new churches. And in Jerusalem, the celebration of the Lord's Passion and Resurrection was something very physically involving. Our Spanish pilgrim, Egeria, tells us about what happened, about the different services at different places in the city, the processions of believers from one part of the city to another, the enormously long services that took place um, at some points in the week, including at least one service where every cleric present preached a sermon. That's a slightly nightmare prospect now, but obviously she felt a bit differently about it in the 4th century. But behind this 4th century recollection lies, many people believe, something much older and much deeper. It's been suggested, and I think it's a very useful suggestion, that the original gospel texts describing the events leading up to Easter were based on short paragraphs written to be used by pilgrims in Jerusalem in the first century, within the first decades 
after the crucifixion. If you read the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, but even the Gospel of John, you'll find a very strong emphasis on place. These are stories which are punctuated by, then they went to, and then they went to, and then they took Jesus to, and he went out from the city, and so on. As if you have a kind of set of stage directions, almost, for people retracing, literally, the journey of Jesus in his last days. From the upper room to Gethsemane, from Gethsemane to the house of the high priest, from the house of the high priest to the palace of the Roman governor, from the palace of the Roman governor to Calvary, and from Calvary to the tomb. So it's been suggested, and as I say, I think this is quite likely, that from the earliest days, believers in Jerusalem liked to follow that course around the city, <clears throat> saying prayers, listening to narratives at particular points, a kind of stations of the cross almost. And because in the fourth century, when new churches were being built in the city, there was quite clearly a serious attempt to follow some existing tradition was about where some of the events of that week had taken place. I don't think it's too far-fetched to believe that what the Spanish tourist Egeria describes had its roots much earlier in the very earliest storytelling that took place by Jesus' followers as they retraced his steps. So there's a first thing to think about in terms of Holy Week. It begins with travel. It begins with journeys. It begins literally putting one foot in front of the other and recognising in that that the journey of Jesus towards his death and resurrection is ours. It's not a story from the past. It's not, as you might say, a ghost walk, such as you might have in some historic cities in England. You've probably been to York or London and see these ghost walks advertised where you can go around the city at night and have all sorts of spooky experiences. Nothing like that. This is retracing Jesus's journey so as to make it our own, so as to let that journey enter into us, shape our imagination and our sense of who we are. And that's why the whole week is a connected story. A story that begins, like some bits of the gospel story itself, it begins with the disciples and followers of Jesus in a spirit of high triumphant optimism. Jesus is received with enthusiasm as he enters into the city. And then, almost immediately, the tone darkens. He goes to the temple, he casts out the money changers, the conflict begins to close around him. And I would imagine that his disciples who had enthusiastically accompanied him on the way into Jerusalem, and many of those who eagerly welcomed him, began to ask, have we actually opened our doors to something so disruptive, so transforming, that we can't really cope with it, and we'd rather push it out of the out of the territory again. The doors, you might say, open on Palm Sunday. Throughout the week, the doors shut down one by one. And at the end of the week on Good Friday, <laughs> Jesus is taken outside the city to die. So it's a journey in which we have to recognize that the place where we start is a place we have to rediscover by a long route, a long detour. Where do we begin? What's at the root of us? I suppose that's what I'd really like to focus on a bit more in thinking about the events of Holy Week. What's at the root? What's at the heart of us? Perhaps that is what Holy Week is about, a rediscovery of what's at the centre of our own identity, our own life. Because if this week is not just the commemoration of a set of historic events, but some kind of renewal of who we are in our faith and our vision, then that element of discovery and disclosure has to be very near the centre of things. 
And that's why, of course, to go back to the history once again, in most of the history of the church and across most of the geography of the church, throughout this history, Holy Week and Easter have represented the climax of preparation for baptism. On the night before Easter, historically, converts were baptized. The long and arduous process of preparation, of which our Lent is a rather faint survival, came to its conclusion with an intensely dramatic ceremony the night before Easter, again described for us by our friend from Spain in the fourth century. A lengthy service with many readings, a service which again involved a journey, people travelling from the baptistry into the body of the church, people stripping off their clothes, going down into the baptismal pool, being totally immersed by the bishop, being anointed with oil and being given a spoonful of milk and honey, which I think is a rather delightful little detail to signify that they had arrived back in paradise. And they were then taken into the church to join the community about to celebrate the Eucharist. Because celebrating Holy Communion together is what you do in paradise. It's the place of communion. It's the place of reconciliation, where our renewed humanity is expressed in a renewed depth of connection and communion with God and with one another. Well, we've moved on quite a long way from that dramatic style of worship that prevailed in the fourth century, though, of course, it's still the case that churches will quite frequently have services of baptism and confirmation as part of their Easter preparation, part of the service in the night before Easter Day, Easter Eve, Holy Saturday. Otherwise, in the old Greek formula, the Great Sabbath, the seventh day, which is about to dawn into the new week, the new age of God's kingdom. So it's not surprising then, if with that in mind, with Holy Week and Easter having such a lot to do with baptism, with renewal, with our new identity in Christ, not surprising that we think of it in terms of that kind of journey to the centre. Let me pick out two aspects of this that seem to me really important and interesting here. One is something that's expressed in a very curious, rather memorable, visual way in a lot of medieval pictures of the crucifixion. You very often see there, at the foot of the cross of Jesus, there is a skull. Now we know from the Gospels that the hill of Calvary where Jesus was crucified was the hill of the skull, or the place of the skull. And we don't know why that name was given to the place. It might have been on the edge of a cemetery. It might have been an execution ground where there are a lot of dead and decaying bodies around, perfectly possible. We must think not just of the rather tidy picture of three crosses on a hilltop, but something a bit more like a bit of open, stony moorland with empty crosses around the place and possibly partly buried or discarded or decomposing bodies lying around the place of the skull, not just a burial ground, but a real charnel house. But the legend developed in the Middle Ages that this was actually literally the site of the Garden of Eden, and the skull in question was the skull of Adam. So when you look at some of these medieval pictures, you'll see Christ's blood running down from the cross, running across the skull of Adam, the very first human being. Because, again, in the thought and imagery of the Middle Ages, what Christ is doing on the cross is restoring what Adam lost. Not simply paying the price of sin, as modern, especially Protestant theology, likes to focus on, but restoring the image of God. Adam steps aside from what God asks of him and tries to be God in his own terms. Remember the serpent says to Eve that if you eat the fruit of the tree, you'll be like gods. 
Adam and Eve decide that that's what they'd like to be. They'd like to make themselves gods. And so they end up being less than human. They reach out to a power and a security that they desire for themselves, for their safety. And in so doing, they actually lose the depth, the heart of their own humanity. Jesus accepting the limits of humanity, not wanting to cling to his divinity, as St. Paul says in the letter to the Philippians. Jesus turn, turns upside down Adam's grasping and reaching out for divine security and divine power. Jesus turns it upside down because what he reaches out for is our human weakness, our human vulnerability, embracing that and declaring in his life and his death that God is completely in solidarity with human weakness, human suffering. Adam wants to escape all that. Jesus says yes to it. This is part of a world we can't shortcut, we can't escape. God enters into it to be alongside us and to transform us by that solidarity. So that image of the blood of the cross trickling down onto the skull of Adam, yes, that is a, a powerful metaphor, the idea that what we have lost by human greed, human obsession with power and control, is somehow overturned, restored. Our humanity is rebuilt by what happens in the events of Good Friday and Easter. So perhaps you can begin to see part of what I mean by suggesting that the events of Holy Week at Easter take us back to our beginnings, take us to the centre of who we are. And that Good Friday image invites us to look at ourselves and say, well, in what ways might our greed, our acquisitiveness, our fearfulness, our terror in the face of the other, our longing to be in charge, in what ways does all that make us less than human? Because the truth seems to be, in the Christian vision, that we are only human in and with one another, and only human when we embrace our own limits and stand in solidarity and compassion with others who face their limits, sometimes limits that are brutal, overwhelmingly crushing and oppressive. And by our solidarity, our action and our compassion, seek to open the doors of fuller humanity to those around us, and also, just as important, to let their love open the doors of our own humanity. All of that is bound up with the rediscovery of who we are, not just in Adam, but in Christ, not just following the example of our first human ancestor who reached out and grabbed for something to keep safe and perhaps to shut others out, but instead being reconstructed, reimagined in the likeness of Christ. The contrast is there already, of course, in St. Paul when he writes about Adam and Christ in the first letter to the Corinthians and in Romans. And you don't, certainly don't have to believe that 6,000 years ago or so there was a real Adam and a real Garden of Eden. The whole point is that whatever is true of humanity's failing, sin and muddle is reversed, transfigured in what happens in the events of Jesus' life and death and rising again. So that's one thing, one aspect of coming back to our beginnings or entering into the centre of who and what we are. And the other, of course, is what happens on the night of Holy Saturday, the night before Easter Day. The vigil, the Easter vigil, which takes place on that night, is a liturgy absolutely shot through with this kind of symbolism. It invites us to think about and re-experience not just the story of Holy Week itself, but the whole story of God's dealings with humanity. It's 
a form of a kind of service which would have been quite common in the early and medieval church, a long reflective nighttime service where you heard a lot of the Bible being read and had a chance to respond in song and psalm and silence. And sadly, that form of vigil service doesn't survive very much in the Western church, though it still does in the Eastern Christian churches. But in that sequence of biblical readings, which begins the vigil, the watch night service for Easter, the first words you hear will be, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so the readings in that vigil service take us back not just to Adam, but to the very beginning of the world. What is happening at Easter is the remaking of our world. We remind ourselves as we listen to those readings that God is the one who creates out of nothing, that God is the one who is utterly free to bring alive something that is different from him. God is so at home, you might say, with being God, that it really doesn't bother God that there should be something other than God. On the contrary, it is part of God's own life to want another life to be. It's been said sometimes that the words, I love you, mean, I want you to be. And in that case, when God says, let there be in creation, God instantly in that moment says, I love you, to creation and to each one of us. And in those readings, in the nighttime service of Holy Saturday, we go back to that first moment of God saying, I want you to be. It's as if God says to us in those readings, I know you have distorted damaged, wounded your humanity about as deeply as you can. I know you're all tied up in relations with one another that are toxic and stifling, but I want you to be. I want you to exist and to live fully and gladly. And that's the point of what's going on in the death and resurrection of Jesus. God's freedom, God's liberty, to overrule our mess, our failure, God's creative liberty to start again. And so as the readings unfold on the night of Holy Saturday, we hear other stories about God's freedom. We hear about God's freedom to bring the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt, God's freedom to promise that God will be their God we hear something of the great visions of a reconciled future ahead, a restored temple out of which will flow living water that will bring deserts into blossom. And finally, we come to the readings about the power of Christ's resurrection and the mystery, the surprise, the shock of that first morning when people realised that Jesus was not, after all, part of the past, part of the future. So that's the second aspect I'd want to underline about what's happening in Holy Week at Easter. It's that vision of God's liberty, that vision of God as creator, not a God who created a long time ago, who wound up the clock, as people often said, set it going, but the God who at every single moment of the world's existence retains the freedom and, we might even say, the longing to make the world afresh, to give us a new start. A new start characterised by intimacy with God and with one another, by communion. And so, just as in those long services in Jerusalem in the fourth century, all of that culminates in celebrating baptism and celebrating Holy Communion. Here we are called by our name, by God, 
summoned into a new set of relationships and given a new identity, a new kind of humanity, free for love, free for service. Here we are no longer simply the children of Adam and Eve. Here we are the brothers and sisters of Jesus of Nazareth, sharing the way Jesus of Nazareth relates to God as Father, as the completely generous, unconditionally loving source and parent of all life and all human reality. And in that confidence, we share what Jesus shares at his table. We share the bread and the wine in which his life is communicated to us. So that's part of what I mean by saying that Holy Week is a journey to the centre of our reality. Yes, we begin with the rather exhilarating story of Palm Sunday, when everything seemed to be going well, and where Jesus seemed to be popular. We move rapidly to the recognition that Jesus' own integrity, Jesus' own spiritual power, Jesus' own centeredness in God, means that he will be at odds with the acquisitive and corrupt world that he lives in and that we still live in. The acquisitive and corrupt world of an imperial power dominating Israel at that time, and also the, you might say, pseudo-imperial power of a small and narrow caste of religious leaders, the controllers of religious institutions who exploit both the Roman occupation and the economic hardship of the people of the area for their own security. Of course, Jesus will run into conflict with that, and the week unfolds that conflict for us. But as it does so, it presses us to recognise that just as this is not simply a story about events 2,000 years ago, it's not simply a story about other people either, about corrupt high priests or oppressive Roman governors. It's a very significant fact that on Good Friday, particularly, when the story of the crucifixion is read in the liturgy in church, the congregation traditionally is expected to take part, to identify with the crowds who shout for Jesus' crucifixion. And it's very interesting that St. Augustine, in the, I suppose, around the year 400, when he's writing his wonderful meditations on the Gospel of John, goes out of his way to say, don't imagine in the story of Jesus' passion that it's about them, it's about you. It's not about other people who did terrible things. It's about your own imprisonment, your own self-destructive habits, but all the ways in which you say no to life. Just don't forget that. Don't try and franchise it out to others. And of course, Augustine is already well aware that Christians will sometimes, all too often in their history, as it were, contract out their own dividedness, guilt and failure onto the Jewish people. Augustine is not guiltless himself of anti-Semitic elements in his thinking, but he's very, very clear in these meditations on St. John's Gospel that when the Gospel talks about those who turned against Jesus, it's about us, not them. We can indulge in any amount of displacement activity and think that oppression, prejudice and cruelty are somebody else's business. But no, says Augustine, and no, say the Gospels, stop, think, look within, look to your roots, look to what's most central. Recognise that you too are capable of saying no to life and to love. But in that moment, recognise also that if God truly is creator, if God truly is free, then God will always be able to begin again. And the resurrection is the most absolute dramatic statement imaginable of what it might mean 
to begin again. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about how God is the one who can bring what is from what is not. And he talks about the new life of Christians as, like the resurrection itself, something utterly new, being brought out of what seems a total annihilation, a total emptying out of meaning and of hope. And that's where we're led by this journey of Holy Week. So, just to sum up, I've tried to give a little bit of historical background to remind us of how the services of this week, the traditional services on Palm Sunday, especially on Monday, Thursday, on Good Friday, Holy Saturday, have their origin in this quite literal journey, walking around, meditatively, meditatively walking around the scenes of Jesus' last days, accompanying Jesus as he accompanies us in our suffering and our struggle. I've underlined the fact that historically all this has a lot to do with preparation for baptism and the great dramatic mystery unfolding on the night of Easter when people are brought into their new life and their new set of relationships into the new holy communion of being together as Christians. And I've thought a little bit about how the way in which the stories are set up and the imagery has unfolded over the years reminds us that what's going on in Good Friday and Easter is the opening up of something deeply locked within us, the opening up once again of the image of God that lives at the heart of every human being. We ourselves discover hope for us in that, but also, I think, no less importantly, we discover hope for all those we encounter, because the image of God is not, once again, not simply a property, a possession of ours. The us doesn't exclude them. The us is a human us, all human beings made in God's image, all potentially restored, restored to fullness of humanity in and through this event. So as we approach Holy Week and Easter this year, maybe we can think a little bit in those terms of this being a week when something opens up in us, something is released. And people sometimes use the imagery of a well that has been filled over decades with, with rubbish. If you can imagine a, a large old well, which is now full of, oh, I don't know what, discarded sofas, old prams, non-functioning fridges and television sets, all kinds of, like a huge, huge rubbish dump. The water can't rise any longer. And in this extraordinary moment that we enter into in Holy Week and Easter, miraculously, the water is allowed to rise. The rubbish may still be there, but the water forces its way up, springs out, overflows, and brings life wherever it flows. One of the texts that is read, in fact, at the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday is, as I mentioned earlier, Ezekiel's vision of the temple in the New Jerusalem, where water pours out from the side of the temple, streaming across the earth and bringing fertility. And that's read, of course, with baptism itself in mind, but it's a powerful image for what goes on in the entire story and the entire encounter that we're involved in through this week at Easter. Thank you very much for listening so patiently. I'll be very grateful for reactions and thoughts about that. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ron Williams, for this um, very faith-provoking talk. Um, as we just heard, uh, approaching the Holy Week and Easter, I was just thinking if you really want to crucify someone uh, in our time, ask him or her to conclude Rowan Williams' talk, what you have simply said to me. Uh, I'm thankful for all what he has said, uh, 
wonderful insights he gave, historical background of the events that happened on in the Holy Week. Uh, Holy Week unlocked the image of God in us. And uh, wonderful imagery he brought in uh, of an old well filled with the rubbish. Eventually, water comes out to clean us and to help us to live a life according to the will of God. Emphasize on places into and from was a wonderful idea which really inspired us that Holy Week is not only an event that happens once in a year. It's a sort of a missional activity that helps us to move on where we are and to go where God is calling us to be. And wonderful quotation from St. Augustine, where, which helps us to find our place in the Holy Week where we are. The story of the Passion of Christ is not the story of others or them, but the story of you and I. Crucify him. The blood of Christ tickling down from the skull of Adam cleans us from our sins. Yes, it was a great privilege and honor to be here and to thank uh, Roman and to you all to be here as the new chair of Christians Aware. It's, uh, we are trying to bring uh, new people in. You all are welcome if you are not member of members of Christian Aware to come and to join us. A lot of wisdom I can see in various rooms through Zoom. Please do come whenever we meet, wherever we meet, and help us and guide us how we can do things which really need to be done as uh, the family of Christians aware for a fragmented and divided world. Finally, uh, seeing Rowan on Zoom, uh, approaching the Holy Weeks, and actually he will be physically with us in Trichowl in Wales, um, on Saturday and Sunday, and hopefully um, talking about the same things, but also different perspectives he will be bringing. If you are interested in listening uh, his online talk on the truth shall set you free, mainly he'll be focusing on the abolishment of slavery. Please uh, get in touch with me or Matt. We will be more than happy to provide you a WhatsApp, not WhatsApp, um, YouTube link. But it is not Christians Aware 1 or 2. It will be St. Edmund's Church, Crick Howell YouTube channel, different channel. But thank you very much for being with us. As some, some of you I know uh, joined from other side of the pool. Some people joined from the Middle East or from Pakistan even. So what a wonderful and joyful thing to be together, to learn from one of the most impressive brain of our time, someone who inspires us all as we approach the Holy Week. Thank you very much.